If you're a DCC modeler and CVs keep you awake at night, I'm going to sing you a lullaby. Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. And before we kick off this week's video, I would like to just thank um, all the various Facebook uh, pages that allow me to post my videos on their channels. I do appreciate it, especially the double O gauge channels. Thank you very much indeed. Right, CVs. Now, if you're somewhat reluctant in having the will, let's say, to change the CVs on your locos, you're pushing on an open door. I understand your pain. Um, I've been there myself, um, but I must confess nowadays I I'm not blasé about it, but I don't really get um, emotionally involved. The most important thing that you need to do before you start mucking around with your CVs is you need to acquire a pen and paper because by writing down and recording the original CV values um, will help you undo any mistakes that you may get yourself into. Now, it is worth mentioning at this stage that re um, changing CV8 to 8 will reset it back to the, its factory settings. Um, many, many years ago, there were a few cases that um, the people who, who wrote the sound projects weren't locking the projects properly, and therefore sending CV8 to 8, you can actually wipe out the sound project itself. But I've never heard of that happening for some, I don't know, must be 10 years now. Um, but it's just something to be aware of, but not something to necessarily be scared of. Right, let's talk about addresses. Now, when you receive your loco, if it's DCC fitted, or perhaps a chip if you buy one, then fit it, um, in accordance with the NMRA standards, it's going to come on address 03. And the first thing you really need to do is decide what address you're going to use. You could use the, nine, the number on the side of the loco, or you may have another strategy. Of course, you might have just a small shunting layout with two or three locos, and locos one, two, five, and six might suit you down to the ground if you can remember which ones are which. Of course, when you get into a bigger layout, let's say, and you might have 10 or 20 locos, then having that method of remembering or you know, reading from a piece of paper to know that your class 47 is loco number 22 and your class 40 is number 39, might be the way you're used to doing it, but it doesn't really hold water once you acquire many locos. There are three CVs involved with numbering, uh, with addressing your locos. That's CV1, 17 and 18, and you need to need not worry about any of them. All you need to do is decide on your numbering, numbering strategy, and then you just crack on. So here are two examples of my locos. I have very reverse livery Pullman, class 251, and it won't become a surprise that it's addresses 251 because it's the only one I've got. Whereas I have several 08 shunters and naturally this one's address is 3105. So once you've successfully addressed your locos, you needn't worry about CV 1, 17 or 18 at all because those CVs are populated by your choice of number. The main thing that you need to do is make sure that you renumber the or readdress them away from address 3, which is obviously the NMRA default for a fresh um, decoder, or one of which you've put CV8 to 8 to restore it to its factory settings. Easy. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and if you hit the little bell icon and go for all, then you get a notification every time I release a new video. Now this rather dashing HiMEC is fitted with an ESU Lock Pilot basic decoder. So what exactly is wrong with its running characteristics? So now we've spoken about CV1 and now we're on to, believe it or not, CV2. CV2 is about slow running characteristics. It's the start voltage for the loco. So if I start this one on speed step one, will it move? And yes, it does very, very slowly, which is fine, because if it didn't, we would have to change its CV. And I'll now show you how we would do that. 
So to change the CVs on this, what system am I going to use? Well, the main layout is a Digitrax layout, but I also have a Backman Dynamics system as well. But it's not about what systems I have or you have or whatever. It's about changing the CVs. So I won't do, use one of the handheld systems. I'll simply show you uh, the CVs and change them on screen using an ESU programmer. So here we are with the HiMEC on my ESU programming track. I need to open the lock programmer and I wish to read CV2. And it comes up with a value of one. And as you recall, this loco had a nice, very slow crawling ability. If it hadn't, then I would change this value to a larger number, two, three or four, back to the track and check it out to make sure we had a decent, steady, slow crawl facility. I have some locos that do have a higher number in here, but this one, value number, value one in CV2 is just fine. Now CVs three and four are acceleration and deacceleration. So if I were to turn this on and then reverse it, as you can see, it's not very, what should we say, prototypical if it's able to stop and then instantly sort of turn around and run the other way. And if I turn the speed up, you can see that it becomes more and more ridiculous. So clearly what we need it to do is to build up its speed so much slower and deaccelerate so much slower. So let's take it back to the track and have a look at that. So now we need to read and note CVs three and four. So CV3 is coming up with a value of eight and four is a value of six. So I'm going to change these. So the acceleration is CV3 and I'm going to change that to 20. So if we press write and of course what I'm doing is writing these details down as we go and CV4 we shall give this a um, value of 30. We'll write that. Okay back to the layout. A little bit of a wider shot this time and I'm going to try and keep it at speed step 20. So there we are at 20 and you can see how much slower it accelerates and deaccelerates. We're not quite there, but we're sort of much closer to what you might expect. Now this performance might suit your locos ideally if you've got modern DMUs that do accelerate and deaccelerate rather quickly, then this sort of level of CV might be ideal. But for this one, we've still got just a little bit more work left to do. So with the loco back on the track, I think for CV3, we're going to up this to 35. And for CV4, we're going to go for 50. Right, let's see how that looks. So I'll do the same sort of test up at speed step 20. And now you can see that it accelerates much more gently. And the deacceleration is better too. And if I drive it manually rather than getting it to turn, so there, here we are, speed set, 16 down to zero. Much more acceptable.
So now we have this locos acceleration deacceleration somewhere in the ballpark of what we're after. It's time to think about CV5, which is the maximum speed that it will run at. So if you ever get carried away and you wang it up to full power, the last thing you want this thing is to do is with its train come careering off all the tracks. So you want to kind of set CV5 to the maximum speed that your layout um, will allow it to run at, or of course, the maximum speed in reality that this type of loco would run with the train it's pulling. So we'll have a look at how fast it will go around a, a short section of track and try to uh, bring the speed down to a more acceptable level. If you're a member of a model railway club and once every Saturday you go piling into the village hall and take out your locos and plonk them on your track, when you turn your back and go for a cup of coffee and Billy decides to run your Hymex or whatever around the layout, of course, he might not have the same care as you, so he'll be running around at max chat. Whereas if you limit the maximum speed, obviously nobody can take it above that level. So let's just see what sort of performance he can do and take it from there. So there she is, the other side of the viaduct. And if I come for a wide shot so we can see it running in, and then hopefully with my other hand, I can stop it. So there she is, full speed. And clearly, <laughs> it's too fast. So we need to back off that speed considerably. So switching now to CV5, I'll have a little read. And we can see it comes up at a value of 42. And that value of 42 seemed to compare to um, the speed of sound with that logo, didn't it? It zinged along. And a maximum speed of a high mech in reality was around about 70. So I think what we shall do is we'll cut that to 20, write that, and then do exactly the same again and see how it looks on the layout. So let's see if we can do this without attempting to break the sound barrier. Still too fast. Well, perhaps third time lucky, because this time I've reduced this value of CV to 12. And now you can see where the settings for CV3, the acceleration, comes in properly, because it accelerates in a much more prototypical fashion. It still gets a bit of a wiggle on as you can see but then again it was a loco that was capable of 70 miles an hour. And that is where we shall leave CV5. So let's talk about CV6. As you can see we have CV2, CV5 and CV6 on a linear graph. CV2 is obviously your start speed, CV5 is your maximum speed and CV6, like I say, is linear, so it will be smack in the middle. But is that typical of all sort of trains? Well, clearly it isn't. So what are we likely to have? Well, let's take a passenger train. Wouldn't necessarily start like that. It's not efficient. So it might start faster and then taper off. So if we draw that in, I'm no artist. So your passenger train would accelerate faster and then your speed would taper off to your max. Whereas, of course, your freight train doesn't accelerate that. It's pulling a lot of coal or uh, fuel tankers or whatever. So it would start more slowly. And then as it picks up its speed, whoa, it's an easy tiger, it would then come up in that sort of fashion. So it's much greater effort at the start. But this is more efficient for passenger trains. Now, switching back to our decoders, on many decoders you can adjust the CV 
6 to where you want it, which will then bring in this type of speed graph. But not all decoders are equal. So with the HiMec back with the ESU programmer, if I select CV6 and I read it, it comes up with a score of 0. And as I said, not all decoders are equal. And this being a Lock Pilot Basic, which is probably sold on as a Backman um, decoder, it doesn't have all the facilities of the more expensive uh, technology that's built in to the better decoders. So what I shall do now, I shall switch this loco for a similar HiMec with a Lock Sound version 3.5 decoder. So to read this one, CV6, read, and it comes up with a value of 7, which is pretty meaningless as we don't know the values of CVs 2 and 5. So let's read 2, which has a value of 1, and CV5. This is a value of 12. So as you can see, that is more or less a linear style graph um, with sort of 7 being midway between 1 and 12. Well, 6 is actually, isn't it? But the, more or less. So now let's adjust this one down and put that value down to below the graph, which might be the value of 5. So CV 6 to value 5, write it. And we'll see how that performs. Now the culmination of our efforts into these CVs should hopefully become evident with the running of this small freight train. It's an unfitted freight and is limited to 30 miles an hour. Lovely. Now hopefully you thought that was a pretty good interpretation of a um, class 8 unfitted freight pulling train. But how did I do it? Well, um, I'm extremely grateful for the Elgin Model Railway Club who've printed out this table on their, uh, on their website. Um, they don't know I found it, but um, fair play to them for putting this up there. And it has different scales and all the, all the gumph that goes with it. And also to Entwine Solutions, they've got a, a different kind of spreadsheet that you populate with times. Um, and links to both of those will be in the Show More tab. So if you're watching on a phone, you're not going to be able to find this. You do need to be on a, on a PC or a fruit-based computer system. So, um, how does it work? Well, as you can see, there's a tape measure and working out from their calculations that at 30 miles an hour it should take 1.7 seconds to travel one foot and if you're from the continent that's just a smidgen over 300 millimeters so i've got this out to three foot so um, in three foot it should take about 5.1 seconds to travel from there 
to there and if it takes 5.1 seconds or thereabouts then we're in the ballpark for 30 mile an hour so i'll start the train up with a stopwatch and start and stop and see what result we get so here comes our little train there's the 36 mark so we start and stop And the result on the stopwatch is 5.24 seconds. And I was after 5.1 seconds. Well, I mean, that's as near as damn it, isn't it? If I were to, if I were to work that back through, I think we're at 1.8 seconds per foot rather than 1.7 seconds. So it's a pretty accurate way of doing things. And the only way of doing it, of course, is by adjusting CV5 because I've set that maximum uh, level to give me um, a result of a 30 mile an hour unfitted freight train so when i go to our model railway club on a saturday if, if we ever get back um, i can just send it around the layout in a truly prototypical god i hate that word a truly realistic speed so it's ideal and of course when i send that train off i just send it off on full power because it's you know there's you know, it's, it's the way it is. I can't put it on half power, otherwise it's going to be doing 15 mile an hour sort of thing. But there is a downside to that. Well, if I'm just going from zero to full power, I'm not really driving my train anymore, am I? Um, no, I'm not. But then I'm not having any crazy accidents or running my railway in a, in a ridiculously fast way. So my thanks go to Elgin Model Railway Club and Entwine Solutions for this uh, for these gumps and I shall leave these links in the show more tab as I said earlier right I think that wraps up this bit now we're going to get on to CV29 bear with me this one isn't that difficult and I've got a beautiful web website link for you now CV29 has seven different inputs and they're known as bits why I'm going to faint this idea and why there isn't seven different CVs, I don't know either, but it's the combination of these seven bit inputs that give you a final total figure that you need to add in to your CV29. And it can, any, it can be anywhere from zero to 255. Well, that's not quite true because you'll find as you add and subtract things, some numbers aren't available. But hopefully when you look at this table, all will become clear. So here is, the web page from the two millimeter scale association and it truly is a gift labeled there dcc cv29 calculator there's lots here to read but in your own time i shall leave a link in the show more tab now i mentioned about bits and bits zero to seven are listed on this side and it's the combination of those that give you your cv value for 29. now if i tick all these you can see the number at the bottom of the box rise, unsurprisingly, from 0 to 255. So I need to untick, if you like, the ones that I never use. So we don't use um, these two at the bottom. The complex speed curve I don't use. Railcom, now if, you, if you're a lens guy with block detection, you'll know about it. I'm a Digitrax guy and Railcom doesn't work with Digitrax even though I am into block detection, so I can untick that one. And then we get to DC operation. Quite complicated, this one. If you run your layout with both DC and DCC, leave it ticked. If you don't use DCC, sorry, if you don't use DC, I suggest you untick it, because if you get a major sort of um, short across your layout, you can get a DC spike and your trains may well go trundling off in strange directions. So just to be on the safe side, untick DC operation if you're DCC only. God, there's a mouthful. So then we move on to uh, speed steps. And I would always suggest you leave this one ticked. Um, it's our standard sort of fall, but reverse direction, I would untick this. That gives um, an output of C of 34 and that's the standard value that I use on my layout into CV29. So this web page here will sort it all out. The only strange one will be the reverse direction. 
because it's the reverse direction one that could well throw you. So what I shall do now is we'll leave this and go back to the layout and I'll explain. Now here we have two handsets that I kind of regularly use. This is my Digitrax one and this is one from a Backman Dynamis. Both straightforward but both have an indication of which way your locos ought to be facing let's say. So first off let's have a closer look at the Digitrax one. So here's the Digitrax handset and hopefully you can see we've got Loco 7017 selected and there's a little steam engine sort of icon with an F pointing that way. So that's forward and as you can see there's a little puff of smoke coming out of the chimney. Beautiful. What could be more simple? Well if I now zoom you back out a little bit and there is 7017. So we're going forwards, so I'll turn it, and there it goes forwards. But you might suggest that it's going the wrong way, because it's heading that way, whereas the arrow is pointing the other way. But it's only facing forward in respect of the loco's direction. Now, this loco is crude at one end. There are two fine-looking chaps in here, and the back end is empty. So this loco will always run this end forward. Now to avoid confusion I said that way is forward. Now if I stop it and I pick it up and I turn it round and put it back on the tracks this direction is still forwards. So regardless of which way the loco is facing whether it's been through a reversing loop or anything else it will always run forwards as in this end will always lead and that end will always be the reverse. So if I double click it and I press reverse off it trundles backwards. Now it's not a Digitrax only idea here because with this um, Dynamis handset there's also a directional arrow and then you change it with this key and you might turn and say okay so that will always be forward and that will always be reverse unless you've got a little end-to-end -end layout and you might do it kind of that way but you put an, a, a loco through a reverse and loop or whatever and then suddenly it's facing the wrong direction but there is one other strange complication and that is when the loco operates um, the wrong way around which I'll show you now now this little gem has the number of 3990 and hopefully you can see here that it's in the forward direction. So if I turn the throttle the loco should run forwards and get away. You're right it runs in the wrong direction. If I double click it so it runs in reverse it now runs forward and this is where we need to go back into CV29 and tick the top box for reverse direction. So with my steam engine installed I come up, select CV29, I read it and it comes up at 35 and obviously um, the reverse direction has been ticked so we untick it we write it that should go to 34 and now when we take it back to the layout it should run in the right direction so here we are once more and we're facing forward so hopefully this time she faces forward and runs forward and if I reverse it she runs backwards lovely and before we finish with this, um, this nifty little spreadsheet there's also a point about this bit here, the back calculator. So if you read your um, value in CV29 uh, and you don't know which ones are ticked, if you enter it in here such as 15 and then you press back calculate and it will show you that you've actually got reverse direction, uh, the speed steps, DCC and Railcom um, selected. So it's a you know a pretty nifty p 
piece of kit and I must start thank the two millimeter scale association because fellas it's marvelous whilst I'm here I thought I'd mention this little nifty track voltage tester which I was sent from Golden Valley Hobbies and the way it works is it's both DC and DCC and you pop it on your tracks and as you can see the three LEDs light up that's for the 5 volts 9 volts and 12 volts and the way I pop it on there so if it's below 5 volts then that light will go out if it's between 5 volts and 12 volts then that light will be on and if it's above 12 volts then the green will be on obviously it's above 12 volts so they're all on um, especially useful I think for um, finding voltage drops and especially if you're a DC layout where you can just run this around your track um, and if you're over the far side because obviously you're not having the same amount of droppers that we use in the DCC world and then you can see if you um, have a voltage drop on the far end of your layout a useful little thing and I'll leave a link in the description and as you can see on the back there are just two sort of pickup pads and there's the the resistors in there and the LEDs and stuff um, yeah but I sort of leave it poked out of the way so I can see that I've got track power all the time and it's above 12 volts DC, uh, 12 volts DCC one thing I haven't mentioned is speed matching and I've still got some research to do on that so that will become the subject of, a, of another video at a later date. I must confess putting this one together has been pretty exhausting over the last four days because of the research and everything else but it has been very rewarding. I've learned a great deal and hopefully you have too. If you have any comments to make then please leave them in the comments section down below and if you enjoyed the video of course give me a thumbs up. I'd always like to thank the people who contribute to the channel and that's the people who donate and of course my patrons and if you'd like to become one there's the button and if you're not a subscriber there should be a button there and I'll see you in two weeks time but a video here and here to keep you busy. Thanks a lot, take care, bye bye.